Genesis 1-2 speaks of the Spirit of God moving over the waters. Or does it? Some say that this is a mistranslation, that it should actually be a wind from God sweeping over the waters. While others still say that it doesn't refer to God at all and should read simply, a mighty wind. Who's right? I've found the key to ending this translation controversy. Join me today as I explore the meaning of Ruach Elohim in Genesis 1-2. Imagine the following scenario. You're sharing the gospel with a Jewish friend, and you turn to Genesis 1 to show them that the Trinity runs throughout the Bible. You turn to 1-2 and read, And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Wait a minute, your friend says. That's a mistranslation. It should actually read, A wind from God was sweeping over the waters. As you're discussing, another friend enters the room. A New American Bible fanatic. Why anyone would be fanatical about the NAB, I don't know. But it's a made-up scenario, so just go with it. Anyway, this friend says, You're both wrong. You should actually just read, A mighty wind was sweeping over the waters. So who's right here? Is it the active Spirit of God, or an impersonal wind from God, or just a simply strong wind? Today I'll look at the original Hebrew to answer this question. But first, let's read the whole verse in English. The ESV reads, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. There are two difficulties translators face in this verse. The first is the phrase Ruach Elohim, commonly translated as Spirit of God. The second is the verb Merehafet, variously translated as hovering, moving, sweeping, stirring, and so on. Ruach can mean spirit, wind, or breath depending on the context. Elohim normally means God, although many scholars suggest that it sometimes can be used as a superlative. That is, a word meaning strong, great, or something like that. The verb, root, rakef, is very rare and occurs only three times in the Hebrew Bible. As it turns out, the meaning of this verb will be the key to unlocking the meaning of Genesis 1-2. Whenever faced with an interpretive difficulty, it's always wise to check the immediate context first. There isn't a lot to help us in Genesis 1, although we do see the word God, corresponding to the Hebrew Elohim, mentioned several times. This isn't too surprising, as professional translators usually will not suggest a meaning that is incompatible with the context, unlike internet commentators. The next thing I like to do is check how ancient translators rendered the verse. This isn't a step a lot of people take, but I think it's very worthwhile. The original translators are a lot closer to the original language, both in native speaking ability and in time. As it turns out, in all the relevant languages, the same word means both spirit and wind, depending on context. Thus, we are left with the verb to examine. The oldest translation is the Greek Septuagint. Unfortunately, it's not much help as it chooses a rather generic verb, which means roughly brought upon. Next up are the Aramaic Targums. Targum Onkelos chooses blow in such a way that suggests the translator saw Ruach as corresponding to wind. The other Targums use the same verb, however they add a phrase of mercy after the word meaning wind or spirit, making it less clear whether the translator had in mind a wind of mercy from God or the breath of mercy from God. The Syriac Peshitta makes perhaps the most interesting choice, choosing a verb which means broods, as in the way an animal cares for its young. Finally, the Latin Vulgate chooses a verb meaning bearing, as in having children, or was carrying. So far, we've seen some support for the Spirit of God and some for the wind from God, but none at all for mighty wind. Indeed, we can quickly throw out this translation. As Victor Hamilton notes, there's no definitive case where Elohim must be superlative, and certainly none of the other 18 occurrences of Ruach Elohim can possibly mean mighty wind. Throw in the confusion that would be caused by switching from God in verse 1 to mighty or strong in verse 2, 
back to God in verse 3, all while using the same word, and we can see that this translation is not viable. Sorry, NAB. Into the trash you go. To resolve the wind versus spirit dilemma, we'll have to continue pushing on the meaning of the verb rocketh. As previously mentioned, it's quite rare. Indeed, it occurs only in two other places in Scripture. In Jeremiah 23.9, it means something like tremble. However, this verse uses a different form of the verb, and thus the meaning is not necessarily close to the meaning in Genesis. The other occurrence in Deuteronomy 32.11, however, is quite helpful. Starting at 32.9, we read, But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob his allotted heritage. He found him in a desert, in the howling waste of wilderness. He encircled him, he cared for him, he kept him as the apple of his eyes, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that Yeraheth over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. There was a time when scholars thought that 3211, and possibly Genesis 1-2 as well, were painting the picture of a brooding bird in line with the Syriac cognate that we saw earlier in the Peshitta. The message translation incorporates this idea into Genesis and reads, God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. However, this view has generally been discarded in light of a stronger Ugaritic cognate. Interestingly, the Ugaritic term only occurs in the context of eagles, where it means something like soar or hover. Either way, it's the picture of a bird in flight, not the picture of a bird brooding over its nest. Further support for the translation hovering comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls. As I've already mentioned, Rakif occurs just three times in Hebrew scriptures. However, it does occur one other time in ancient Hebrew literature, in a very interesting text, 4Q521, or more descriptively, the K4 Messianic Apocalypse. The text speaks of how the heavens and the earth will listen to the Messiah, and through him will experience the Lord. It then remarks, For the Lord will consider the pious, and call the righteous by name, and his spirit will hover upon the poor, and he will renew the faithful with his strength. Spirit is of course Rurak, and hover is Rakath. Thus, we have a sentence with the subject Ruach and verb Rakath, that cannot possibly refer to a wind blowing or sweeping, and quite naturally describes the Spirit of God hovering upon, or as we might say in English, abiding with, the poor. You may have noticed that I started my quotation at Deuteronomy 32.9, even though the context wasn't strictly necessary to determine the meaning of the verb. In 32.10, the word translated as waste is the Hebrew tohu, while not quite as rare as rakath, this is another rare word, and it occurs in Genesis, where it is translated as without form. Killian has suggested the word has a connection with the primordial chaos common in ancient creation accounts. Remember that, as I'll return to the idea of chaos in a moment. The proximity of the two rare words and the overall picture of these passages leads Kenneth Matthews to conclude that Deuteronomy 32, 10-11 it's probably a deliberate echo of Genesis 1-2. Whether it was a deliberate act of the human author or not, I can't say, but there definitely seems to be a connection between the two passages. Just as God actively created the world out of the formless chaos in Genesis 1, in Deuteronomy, he is carving out a homeland from the waste of the desert. So both the association of the verb with birds and the parallels we can draw between Genesis and Deuteronomy suggest that the active presence of God is intended in the passage. Choosing the translation, the Spirit of God was hovering, makes better sense in the immediate context of the verb as well. Returning to Genesis 1-2, there are three clauses in our sentence. Number one, the earth was without form and void. Number two, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And three, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. In Hebrew, the three clauses are connected by a vav. 
which normally functions similar to the English conjunctive AND. However, it can also take on other functions, and some translators see the second vav as being disjunctive, that is, functioning like the English but. As already suggested, the first clause has a possible connection to the primordial chaos. The second clause reinforces this idea, as both dark and deep are words associated with chaos. The deep here is the watery abyss possibly conceived as bottomless. So the picture painted by the passage is a dark, empty world over a dark, endless water. The third clause is largely parallel with the second, but with a decided twist justifying a disjunctive view of Av. The darkness being over the deep is contrasted with Ruach Elohim hovering over ordinary water. Without God, there is nothing. But now creation is about to come to life as God has entered the scene and will speak, let there be light, in the following verse. An impersonal wind sent by God does not provide the proper contrast between these two clauses. Furthermore, if verse 2 does refer to a wind, the wind doesn't seem to be doing anything, as there's nothing to act upon. Thus, we have three good reasons to conclude that Ruach Elohim is better translated as Spirit of God. One final question remains. Should Spirit be capitalized or not? In other words, does the verse refer to the Christian conception of the Holy Spirit, or does it just refer to God's presence in a generic fashion? Certainly there are places in the Old Testament that teach divine plurality, that is, multiple persons within one God, and there's solid evidence that some Jews saw this multiple person aspect of God's nature before Jesus' time. However, is Genesis 1-2 one of those places? In fairness, I don't think this is a question that can be definitively answered. However, there's certainly nothing in the passage to rule out the Holy Spirit, and the active presence of God hovering over the waters certainly would seem to imply a person. Furthermore, the Holy Spirit is often depicted as a bird in Scripture, and as we've seen, the verb here has strong avian connotations. Nothing definitive, but the suggestion does seem to be valid. I'm fine with saying that the original audience wouldn't have seen this, but due to the divine nature of Scripture, the meaning was there all along, and as people learned more about God, the hidden meaning was revealed. However, I may have found a smoking gun that shows that Jewish thought recognized the possibility even before Jesus' time. Among the Dead Sea Scrolls is found a text labeled 4Q422, or more descriptively, Cave 4, Genesis and Exodus paraphrase. The text is very fragmentary, but as the name suggests, it is thought to be a paraphrase of the books of Genesis and Exodus. In the creation account, the second legible line is reconstructed to read his work which he had done and his Holy Spirit. We don't know the verb that the final phrase takes as the text breaks off there. However, the presence of the word kodesh, meaning holy, means that ruach must mean spirit here. The construct he, referring to God, and his Holy Spirit strongly suggests that the author of this paraphrase not only saw Ruach as meaning spirit, but also saw the Holy Spirit as a distinct person acting on creation. Thus, we have pre-Christian evidence that the divine plurality was seen in Genesis 1-2. In conclusion, Genesis 1-2 refers to the Spirit of God actively involved in creation. The Spirit acts upon the primordial chaos in preparation for the days of creation that follow. The verse is completely compatible with the Christian understanding of the Holy Spirit, and there's solid evidence that this divine plurality was seen by Jewish people before the coming of Jesus. In full, my translation might read, Now the earth was formless and desolate, and darkness was over the surface of the watery abyss, but the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. What do you think of my translation? Be sure to let me know in the comments, and subscribe to this channel, then hit the notification bell to be alerted of more videos just like this one. Thanks for watching.